जे अनिलो प्रेमा दरम खाचो जे अनिलो प्रेमा I first met Jamal Krishna Goswami in 1976. This was when I wanted to join ISKCON. And it, that, was a, that was a bad time to join ISKCON because ISKCON was starting to feel the heat of its aggressive book distribution and just preaching in general. Many, many, many young people, very young people like me, were joining ISKCON, and I was only 15 or so. And so that was a controversial thing. Do we let him join or do we not let him join? So just as Tamal Krishna Maharaj used to do with Vishnu Jan Swami, he had kind of paired himself with Rameshwar Swami at the moment. And Rameshwar Swami was a nice guy on my side, and Tamal Krishna Goswami was you know, very strict. So he was arguing, no, you, you, you know, this this boy cannot join, he's too young, it's a liability for our movement, it's not very good, it's illegal also, so many things, he had all the arguments. And on the other hand, Rameshwar Swami was saying, no, no, he's a devotee, he's chanting 16 rounds, he's faithful, he's, you know, we don't know how long Prabhupada will be here, he has to join now, and like that. So it was a little tough. So. I didn't realize it then because I was too young and too new. But Chaval Krishna Goswami and Rameshwar Swami were testing me. So Tamal Krishna Maharaj had told me to come at 12 o'clock sharp, and I did. I was right at 12 o'clock on the dot. And uh, when I came, I saw that I was in the door. They opened the door, and he was in front of a plate of prasadam on a table. Just, and he said, you know what? We're just about to take prasadam. And you cannot keep Krishna waiting because Prasadam is Krishna. <laughs> it was very typical to Mal Krishna Goswami. He was a devotee of Prasadam, 100%. So he said, come back tomorrow at exactly this time and we can talk then. So I did that. And then, you know, this, that's when the Rameshwar TKG you know, debate was going on. But uh, I could understand from that first impression that number one, he's very careful, and number two, he's very fond of prasadam. And that uh, <laughs> that impressed me. When he said prasadam is Krishna, I was so new that it had not occurred to me before. But I, I knew enough of the philosophy that it, it made sense, and I appreciated that. Yeah, I actually joined first in California, and uh, at some point the, the manager saw it as advantageous to send me away to New York, which is on the other side of the country from California. So I ended up, uh, the first time I actually saw Tamal Krishna Maharaj was when I was serving in what we used to call New Varshana. That is now known as Gita Nagari farm community in Pennsylvania. And so he and Guru Kripa Maharaj and Drishtaduna Maharaj had come for some reason to Gita Nagari or Nuvarshana and they saw that I was an available brahmachari. In those days, any, anywhere they went, they were always looking for new brahmacharis to take onto the party. And this was in the fall, late in the fall of 1976. So they were, they were already thinking about the winter book distribution marathon. And so they, they wasted no time in getting me to join the Radha Damara Traveling Sankirtan Party, which was a great opportunity for me. It was not only a tremendous, tremendous training uh, in Brahmachari life, but it was also a lot of fun for a 15-year-old. <laughs> so I was traveling all over this, all over the Midwest and eastern part of the United States and uh, we didn't see after that 
they took us first to Memphis, Tennessee, where the devotees had uh, a house rented, and uh, all the six buses of the Radha Damodar party, they met together, including Tamal Krishna Goswami, and they just had a coordination meeting for the upcoming book distribution marathon. And that was just a few days, but it was intense, and the kirtans were very, very loud. In fact, the police were coming every morning after Mangalarti because the neighbors were calling them. And uh, you have to understand, at that time, virtually all of the brahmacharis on Radha Damodar party, they were below 25 years of age. <laughs> so there was a lot of enthusiasm. So much so that when they were dancing in Kirtan, the floor fell through. <laughs> It was an old house, and the floor just fell through. <laughs> I don't know how they ever resolved that with the landlord, but anyway, we were gone from pretty soon after that to begin the marathon. And so we traveled to New Orleans, and we traveled to uh, North Carolina and other places. Um, even in sub-zero temperatures, we were distributing Prabhupada's books because we were all just thoroughly enlivened by the idea that Prabhupada said he was always thinking of the boys in the vans distributing his books. And Tamal Krishna Goswami had a system of coordinating that entire party. This is, this is before the internet, this is before any kind of instantaneous messaging or, or communication. Everything was done by phone and manually. And so <clears throat> he would he was in that time actually in India. He had come to be Prabhupada's secretary and servant for the last year. And, uh, but he was in regular touch with his representative in New York. Radha Damodar Party had its head office in New York City. Ganapati. He's now Ganapati Swami. And so Ganapati Swami would keep in touch with all the buses, and all the buses would keep in touch with all the vans. And so there were, there were so many people reporting all to the central office who reported to Tamal Krishna Goswami. What are the scores? How many books are distributed? Um, how is everybody doing? Etc. Etc. And he would plan out the strategy all the way from India, which in 19, late 1970s, that was really quite a feat. Hundreds of people. Radha Damodar Party bus, each bus had perhaps two dozen brahmacharis and up to six vans associated with it and each van had three or four men who would constantly travel together and just go all over the country so that's what we were doing and uh, i was on the radha damodar bus itself with the radha krishna deities radha damodar those deities were later transferred to gita nagari pennsylvania where they remain to this day they were vishnu john swami's deities and then Tamal Krishna Goswami, Radha Dharma kept him. Now the Radha Damodar party didn't really stay together for very long after that. And Tamal Krishna Goswami, we didn't have his association also for so much. But uh, that that I remember. That was that was my second meeting with Tamal Krishna Maharaj. Uh, other than that, I had been acquainted with uh, a very thoughtful article that he wrote for the Back to Godhead magazine called You Can't Eat Nuts and Bolts. <laughs> we could update that today by saying you can't eat computer microchips, but that was his uh, that was his uh, way of emphasizing the importance of the Mayapur project as Prabhupada envisioned it. He was in India at that time, and he saw what that in the last year, especially, Prabhupada was really, really thinking very seriously about how to implement this rural agrarian uh, self-sufficiency model within ISKCON. And Tamal Krishna Goswami was always 100% involved in anything that Prabhupada was thinking or doing. That's why Prabhupada liked him so much. Anything, any assignment, no matter how easy or difficult that he was given by Prabhupada, it was his personal policy that it would not fail. He was that kind of, you know, classic uh, overachieving type A personality. And he he really didn't fail. <laughs> Very few things that, that he attempted, you know, failed. But uh, in that time, um, there was some friction between the temple presidents and the 
Radha Damodar party in particular because you know like like myself they were taking brahmacharis from here and there and everywhere and so the pre temple presidents could couldn't keep their brahmacharis and the temples were all full of women <laughs> so it was a problem so and they were complaining also because he was heavy um, in fact in those days he had the nickname hot tamale tamale is this Mexican preparation that Americans know about it's very very hot chilies so you know that was their nickname because he was he was too sweet to resist but too hot to stand at the same time and <clears throat> Another way that you can describe him, I, the way that I generally describe him is a coconut, because Hitopadesh describes that a true friend is like a coconut. He may be very rough and hard on the exterior, but very soft and sweet on the inside. And that was Tamal Krishna Maharaj. He was the most personal, the most warm, the most kind, compassionate, thoughtful person, uh, maybe that I've ever met. and. Uh, many people didn't get past a hard shell exterior to really experience that or to perceive it even or to believe in it but uh, those who did uh, they they remain uh, very respectful of him to this day so it, it it actually took me some time to appreciate that about him because he was so thoroughly steeped in transcendental duality that it would appear given his personality that he was a a megalomaniac or um, I want to say instead <coughs> uh, self-aggrandizing because everything he, he was always interested in everything and he always wanted it and he always wanted to be the best at it that was his nature so you know many people misunderstood that about him it was hard hard to appreciate but after after many years uh, I finally came to respect uh, because I saw consistently of, as, a, as, a, as a pattern that uh, everything that he did it was always for the ultimate welfare of ISKCON and in, in order to fulfill Srila Prabhupada's desires for example <coughs> Srila Prabhupada in 1976 uh, you know this this whole issue of the Grahastas versus the Brahmacharis and Radha Damodar versus the presidents it, it all came to a head at the Mayapur festival in 1976 I think it was 76 if memory serves and <clears throat> the you know the situation was very tense and Prabhupada had to deal with all this stuff in the same way that sometimes we still have to deal with problems even today when God brothers disagree about how to do things so Srila Prabhupada was talking to Tamal Krishna Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada was telling him so many things and Tamal Krishna Goswami was also venting his frustration because I, I mean he even wanted to send all the women in the movement to Australia because <laughs> so, his vision was that you know the more brahmacharis the more book distribution the more preaching the better <laughs> and you know you you can't say that the, the, you know the, the, his motive was wrong <laughs> but uh, Prabhupada saw things perfectly and Prabhupada gave instructions according to his perfect vision and <clears throat> so Tamal Krishna Goswami was you know expressing his frustration at you know having to deal with his god brothers and compromise his vision because his vision was always the best vision uh, in his mind as well as other people's minds at least some other people. So, at one point he just shook his head. Tamal Krishna Goswami just shook his head and, and told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I might as well just go to China. I'm so frustrated with these people. And Prabhupada was stunned. <laughs> Prabhupada stopped and looked at him and said, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> and from that point on, Prabhupada would not let go of that. So the next morning, Tamal Krishna Goswami immediately realized it. <laughs> what have I said? The next morning, Trivikrama Maharaj poked his head into Tamal Krishna Maharaj's room at Mayapur. Now, Trivikrama Maharaj and Tamal Krishna Maharaj, they didn't always get along. So you can imagine it is with a certain amount of glee that <laughs> Trivikrama Maharaj told Tamal Krishna Maharaj that Prabhupada wants to see you. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so Srila Prabhupada's order cannot be neglected. Tamal Krishna Goswami, nonetheless, he just shook his head and said, I'm not going, because he knew right away what is, what's going to happen at this meeting. So finally, what could he do? He had to go. And Srila Prabhupada <coughs> told him that, you know, it's, it's actually a very good idea. I want you to go to China. You have to pick the best men that you can to accompany, two, two, two three assistants you can take with you, but it's time for us to go to China. Prabhupada was like this. Just as Tamal Krishna Goswami was very forward-thinking and he thought big and he had big plans and very ambitious in his own way, Srila Prabhupada was even bigger. So he had to do it. And uh, another, another god-sister told me when she was Prabhupada's secretary that uh, Prabhupada used to actually spin the... He had a globe somebody had given him. And he used to spin this globe and just put his finger and stop the globe. And then he thought, we'll send someone here. <laughs> and then he would spin, spin the globe again and it would end up somewhere else. And he would be, you know, some far off place. And Prabhupada was constantly thinking like this. If he saw a house, he would look at the house, he would walk in a rich neighborhood, he would see a mansion and he would start calculating. Here's where the prasadam room will be there, the deities will go there. and. This is how Prabhupada thought, and Tamal Krishna Maharaj was also like this. So instantly he put his determined attention and focus into the, this China mission. And those who know him know very well that anything on which Tamal Krishna Goswami focused his determination was either going to be burnt up or, you know, successful. Because <laughs> he, 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 he would always carry things through to the end like that. So, at some point, after some research, they, they all decided, Prabhupada decided, that uh, it wasn't the right time to go to China, because 76 was right around the time that China was killing all of its own top members, members of, the, of the Communist Party. So, it was a dangerous situation. Prabhupada told him, just wait. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj wanted to rejoin the Radha Damodar party, but Prabhupada wanted him in India, and he became Prabhupada's secretary at that point. Then, uh, after the Radha Damodar party uh, was preaching for some time in America, it, it eventually disbanded, and I didn't have his association again until about 1978. In 1978, he came back from India, and of course Prabhupada had left uh, the year before, and he, it was a new era for ISKCON, a very difficult era for ISKCON. After, after Prabhupada's departure for at least six months or closer to a year, every single class in every single ISKCON temple was only on one topic, and that was Prabhupada's disappearance and how we will carry on in Prabhupada's absence and the separation that one should feel from the spiritual master and the dedication to his mission that one has to display. <clears throat> Tamal Krishna Goswami, if you read his 1978 Vyas Puja offering, um, you will see that he, he turned his whole attention post Srila Prabhupada's physical departure to the membership of ISKCON, and he became, as it were, the servant of all the devotees of ISKCON. This was his mentality. And um, that's how he dealt with the separation that he felt from Srila Prabhupada. He told me this. And so he came and he started doing very big things in America, because everything he did was like that. Um, I, I saw him again when he came to St. Louis. And uh, at that time, some, some months before, this is a, an important event, um, in Mumbai they were taking a walk on Juhu Beach near the temple. And Tamal Krishna Goswami saw something sparkling in the sand, just, in the, just at the edge of the ocean and land. Neither land nor water, but just Tatastha. And it was neither night or day because it was dawn. It was, a, it was a junction, and the stars were in the sky, the sun and the moon were both present, the ocean, the land, all the demigods were there. And Tamal Krishna Goswami saw this sparkling in the sand, so he told the disciples to go see what this is. 
the disciple went to dig out the sand and there was a small deity of Krishna this big, silver. And they found this deity that had been sitting in the ocean for who knows how long. And he was covered with so much uh, growth from the ocean. So they decided that they have to take this deity back to the temple and they cleaned him up for many hours. And they couldn't go to take prasadam because Krishna has appeared. He felt this. And uh, so then, then he actually he installed that deity, ch chanted the Brahma Samhita prayers. Some, somebody sent some clothes that just happened to fit the deity perfectly. So from out of nowhere, this is how these things happen. And uh, so that's, that's how this deity came about. He was called Gopinath in the beginning. And then uh, in 1978, when Tamal Krishna Maharaj first came back to America, he came to St. Louis. I happened to be situated in St. Louis at that time as a brahmachari on the former Radhadamarar party, but now I was just part of St. Louis Temple. And uh, so he came and he brought that deity with him. Now in Mumbai, when the Maharani heard about the appearance of this small silver deity, she immediately arranged to have a little golden Srimati Radharani made to match, somewhat smaller. So silver deity of Krishna and a smaller golden a deity of real gold, deity of Srimati Radharani. And uh, so he brought that deity with him and the Radharani deity was installed in on Radhashtami in 1978. And uh, I was fortunate to be made his the deity's pujari at that time. And uh, so Tamal Krishna Maharaj was traveling. He had a motor home in that at 78, and he took his deities with him. He himself was doing the puja for the deities every day and going around and preaching and doing programs. And I, I was very fortunate that he, he called me to assist him in that. So that, that was my great fortune. And uh, it was also my first really personal interaction with Tamal Krishna Maharaj that uh, on a daily basis and I he got to know me and I got to know him and uh, he he gave me several instructions in the beginning he was a little bit hard on me because he was like that or he could be like that and uh, but I think he quickly saw that I was not able to really handle that kind of dealing and so he became very soft one day he was chastising me all day long everything I did was wrong and it was 200% wrong and he was really really I, I pretty sure he was just testing me to see where I stood and what the, <laughs> what would happen but he must have seen that it was really discouraging me so at the end of the day this is maybe you know nine o'clock at night after I had put the Radha Damodar deities to bed I have to explain this the same deity that was appeared in Mumbai was called Gopinath at that time. When they came to America, in consultation with Satsarup Maharaj, Tamal Krishna Goswami renamed the deity as Damodar, because Satsarup Maharaj suggested that, look, you, you're famous for the Radha Damodar party, now you have these little deities and you're still traveling, so it's obvious this is the reincarnation of Radha Damodar. So they were now called Radha Damodar. So I had put Radha Damodar to rest and uh, I was going to take rest myself. And then uh, the buzzer went off. <laughs> he had a buzzer in his office. <laughs> he used to like buzzers. Uh, some years later, I remember in Dallas, it was that um, somebody decided to change his buzzer and put a more gentle ringtone of some sort. And he said, no, I, I, I like that sound. <laughs> he liked to get people agitated and, and, and alert, you know. He liked, he liked to keep everyone on edge. Actually, Satsarup Maharaj, when he went to visit Gita Nagari around that time, he noticed that everybody in, in Gita Nagari was very peaceful and everybody's chanting japa and they're all happy and the cows are grazing peacefully and Everything's just very serene and sattvic and very nice. And to Mal Krishna Maharaj, his, his personality was different. So he thought, you know, there's, there's something wrong with this. 
if this is my zone, everybody would be working hard, everybody would be in anxiety, everybody would be pent up, and you know, because that's that was his mood, active uh, preaching, you know, aggressive kind of uh, preaching mood. Anyway, <clears throat> so yeah, he put the DT, I put the DT to rest, and he called me into this room with this buzzer. And so I came expecting anything, <laughs> and he said, <clears throat> He told me to come here, and he gave me a piece of sandesh. It was the same sandesh that I had personally offered earlier to Radha Damodar. He said, if you, if you eat this sandesh that you have personally offered to Radha Damodar, then I guarantee, I promise, you will become Krishna conscious in this lifetime, and you will go back to Godhead. <laughs> that was his mercy. So that's not the kind of thing you easily forget when something like that happens. <clears throat> then, uh, this is 1978, 1979. Uh, this is Texas. By this time we had moved to Texas from St. Louis. And uh, he was preaching in Dallas. He was preaching in Houston. Houston, the, the demographics of these two cities were very different. The, the huge Indian population in Houston, I think at that time it was probably the biggest Indian population in the United States, especially Gujaratis. And the Gujaratis are already Vaishnavas, and he was already experienced how to deal with Pushti Margiyas and Swami Narayana people, and all this. He knew exactly what to do. So he grew the entire congregation in Houston, made it very vibrant and successful there. And he did the same thing in Dallas, even though the demographic in Dallas is very different. In Dallas, Satsarup Maharaj had left Dallas to go to Gitanagari <clears throat> and take care of the original Radha Damodar deities. <clears throat> and in fact, he took the small Radha Kalachanji deity with him <laughs> because he couldn't, he couldn't bear the separation. So Tamal Krishna Goswami inherited an empty temple and an undeveloped zone in 1978. Maybe it was Krishna's arrangement because Krishna knew that only he could really make something happen there, and he really did. Uh, with about, there were maybe two or three people, the Pujari and the cook in the temple, Dallas Temple. Dallas is a big temple. But there were only two or three people, and the building was old, and it was falling apart, and it wasn't in the greatest part of town. So it was a problem, and he had, he had the vision, and he had the drive, and the intelligence to turn it around. So instantly what he did was he brought in whatever devotees he knew were around in the United States, and were free, and were ready to help work with him and he put them to work to, to make this community uh, what it is even today, a very successful, stable, Krishna conscious community, because of his foresight and his vision. He always was thinking seven or eight, ten steps ahead of everyone else, and <clears throat> he knew what would work with preaching. Because in 1977, you can see the photos in New York City, he was there with Prabhupada in Manhattan. That was. I'm sorry, 1976, uh, he was there with Prabhupada in Manhattan. And Prabhupada told him at that time, from now on, don't open any more temples. From now on, you should just have Hare Krishna restaurants and reading rooms where people can just come and sit comfortably and read my books and take prasadam in the restaurant. So, Tamal Krishna Goswami Whenever he received an instruction from Srila Prabhupada, even if he couldn't immediately fulfill that instruction, but he never forgot that instruction because Prabhupada also told us the spiritual master's order cannot be neglected, but it may be delayed because everything depends on time. If you have the right idea and the right motivation and you're guided by the right people, but the time is wrong, it won't work. And he knew this and Prabhupada knew this. and so. Um, he was thinking of this instruction. And so a few years later, around 1980-1981, Tamal Krishna Maharaj uh, decided that it was time to fulfill this instruction of Prabhupada. So he had all these carpenters and you know planners and you know, people of all sorts. He, he just knew how to engage everyone because he had a fantastic amount of empathy 
And within about two minutes of being with any stranger, he could understand everything about that person's level of adhikar, the person's faith, the person's material desires, the person's socioeconomic background, the person's everything. He just knew everything about a person. And he had such intelligence also and such sensitive heart and such a drive to serve Prabhupada's mission that he just, Krishna always gave him the intelligence how to engage people. And he did that. And so he built this fantastic restaurant and he also renovated the temple. His whole idea was to have the restaurant in the temple, right contiguous to the temple, as part of the same building complex. Because that's the only way that the people will come to the temple. Prabhupada told him with the Radha Damodar party, you, you have to take the party to the people. The people are not going to come to the temple, you have to take the temple to the people. That's what the bus party ethos was. That was the, that was the uh, process. And so he didn't forget that. And uh, he also remembered what Prabhupada told him in New York 1976. And so he built this temple first, priority. Um, so because it was him managing every detail, uh, it was tremendously successful. He also had the foresight when the, when the restaurant was finally ready, when the temple also was finally ready, he had the temple completely renovated. It, it cost a lot of money, actually, in the 1980s. It was, it was, it was a big project. Beautiful temple, uh, renovation, nice, beautiful mural, murals on the walls. Uh, so he put this all up. And uh, he did a publicity campaign, and he particularly targeted the leading members of the Society of Dallas. In the United States at that time, Dallas is about the most conservative and particularly Christian area that you could imagine. And notwithstanding that, he was fearless and bold and he just he approached everyone and uh, maybe surprisingly, they, they all responded very positively and he made a lot of friends in high places and they, they all became the patrons of the restaurant and the whole community was thriving as a result of that. And uh, so people, devotees also started coming because he opened a Gurukula as well, or rather re uh, revivified the Gurukula that Prabhupada had started there. So it, it became a very successful community. And this he was doing in other places there also in the United States. Wherever he went, this was the, this was the magic. He had that uh, Chintamani touch. <clears throat> so... Um, but he also had this nature that uh, he was driving people very hard and uh, it was not easy to deal with him. Many, many devotees got threatened by his success, I think, as, as much as by his preaching strategy at that time, which was don't burn, burn people out by ripping them off, by selling books in underhanded ways and, you know, don't do things like that. Uh, be, be very... Uh, uh, you know, exemplary in all your behavior and, you know, people already have our books, but people need to read the books and they need to come to our restaurants and we have to cultivate the people who have already read people, Prabhupada's books because there are people in the Western countries, at least at that time, who had read Prabhupada's books, but they weren't joining ISKCON because they didn't like the ISKCON that they saw. And he saw that and he was sensitive to that and tried to change it, but Many, many devotees in ISKCON got threatened by his radical, uh, I mean, he was out of the box in many ways. His, his strategies were just very hard to understand. So, um, then he was disciplined by the GPC because people thought, he's trying to take over ISKCON. <laughs> and he, he probably would have done it, actually if, you know, if he was allowed to do it. <laughs> and he certainly could have done it. And maybe he even should have done it, actually. <laughs> he, was, he was not afraid to take on an, a, a position of authority. And he was also confident to fulfill that position. And, and you know, a lot of people were threatened by that as, as much as by his harsh exterior. And so ultimately it came to the GBC again, just as it had in 1976. This was maybe 1985 or something. And the GBC did virtually the same thing that Prabhupada did in 76 and said, 
go to China. <laughs> and so he did. He, he just surrendered to that. He surrendered his whole zone and he surrendered everything. And he just left everything and went to China to preach. And the result is that there are many happy people in China chanting Hare Krishna in 2023. Because he was intelligent enough to do it, he was determined enough to do it, he had the order on his head to do it, and he, he did it. And you can't criticize that for anything. At the same time, it, it was disastrous for his zone. In those days we had zones all over the world. And uh, it was very hard on his disciples. But he, he maintained, he, he set the example because he was so foresight, foresightful that he, he could understand that in the future people will look at what I've done and they will judge. And so I have to do the right thing, which in this case is to surrender to the order of the GBC, because the GBC is Prabhupada's representative in 1985. So <clears throat> that's what he did. Um, I was personally at that time in Austin, Texas. In Austin, Texas, one of the restaurants that he started was about one block from the University of Texas, 50,000 students. And three, two or three blocks from the state capitol building. So all the legislators from the capitol building and all the students from the university, they would come for lunch every day. And it was phenomenally successful, just like in Dallas. So, but when he lost Dallas, he also, he lost everything. And the first thing that the new person did who came to replace him was to stop all these things. Uh, Dallas restaurant, he kept going. Austin restaurant, they closed down. It was, it was a terrible loss. And God only knows how much that property is worth now. But if they had kept it, it would have been still. People like George Wald were coming to our restaurant. George Wald was a uh, nuclear physicist who won a Nobel Prize. These, these were the caliber of people who were coming to this restaurant. And it was a tremendous success. So it was a real shame, but uh, he took it all as part of his duty. And uh, he went to China and preached very successfully there in China. And uh, eventually things settled out. He, he came back and Dallas uh, resumed he, his position in Dallas and other places. So that was, that's how he operated. Um, I received several letters from him and instructions in those letters, but uh, didn't really have any personal interaction so much because he was in China much of the time, very much of the time. But uh, he did engage me in various ways. In, in later years, I had gone back to school, and in later years, he also went back to school because he felt increasingly frustrated in the increasingly politicized atmosphere of the GB, of the of ISKCON and the GBC relations and things, and so he was looking for a new f preaching frontier, and uh, some of his god brothers encouraged him to enter the academy and start doing academic preaching, which he did. There too, he instantly became very successful, very famous, and very uh, much loved by the, his academic colleagues. One case in point is, is just really extraordinary, that uh, he was what they would call a non-traditional student, and he, because he was about 50 years old, 49 or something at this time, and you know, it's, he's surrounded by 20-year-old kids who are studying in college, but uh, he wanted to do that. So he went to see the, he phoned up the Department of Religious Studies at Southern Methodist University and said he wanted to enroll for the upcoming uh, session of classes. And he was very politely informed that the enrollment period is over now, but you can wait for next semester. You, you, it's not the kind of thing you tell Tamal Krishna Goswami. He, he just, he didn't like that. And so he went and visited personally the department chair, Dr. Lonnie Cleaver. And he had a very, uh, I would say, monumental meeting with Dr. Cleaver. He told him who he was, what his position is, uh, what his history was. And somehow or other in that meeting, he convinced Dr. Cleaver not only to let him enroll in the university and in his department in, in particular, 
but Dr. Cleaver gave him his own office in the department in, in the de department headquarters. Un, he's an undergraduate student. He doesn't even have a baccalaureate degree. But Dr. Cleaver was so impressed by his personality and by his history, because he's a, he's a scholar of religious studies. He's the kind of person that Dr. Cleaver was just get very excited about. So he was immediately part of the staff as an undergraduate. Uh, he was he learned Sanskrit and he learned several things and I was helping him in that um, because I had already gone through that and uh, so he in particular he had me helping him with his Sanskrit I remember one occasion that he had some problem in, in his Sanskrit work and so he was asking me to help him with it and so I was trying to very politely point out to him that you know this is this is it was something like Sunday rules or something this is how it works and you know here you can see in the book this is where it's explained and so you have to kind of adjust like that I was trying to put it as tactfully as I could so he, he didn't like that <laughs> he was arguing with Dr. Robert Goldman's book and uh, Devavani Pravesika and uh, yeah that was that impressed me <laughs> so uh, on another occasion I remember he was writing some sort of paper and he he had me to look at the paper. He wanted just to get my insights about which direction the paper should go in. And I, I personally, I thought that there were fundamental structural flaws in the paper. And uh, I told him so. And uh, he didn't like to hear that also because, you know, he just didn't have time to wait to fix anything. So he just told me that, you know, Mukunda, you, you're pressing the wrong buttons. You, you can't do this. <laughs> So I backed off and let him do it the way he wanted. But uh, he was he was a person who one journalist described as imperious. He he had a staff and, and at one point there was another paper essay he was working on for a book that he subsequently published. And he had like six or seven people all engaged in doing various tasks to help him write his paper. And, you know, they weren't contributing any content, but they were doing this thing and that thing. And yeah, I personally felt, and uh, another god brother, Sanyasi, who was visiting at the time, he also felt that you, you cannot involve so many people in a paper and, and expect that it's going to be easy to write. So anyway, he's, these were some of my experiences. But uh, he was deeply appreciative of, the, of that help somehow or other, even... I, I didn't really do anything very significant, but he really, really appreciated it. Uh, he surprised me because one day at the end of his uh, academic year, he just told me, Mukunda, I'm going to India. I want you to accompany me uh, to, where did we go? We went to Israel and then uh, Paris, Israel. And for some reason, I didn't go to all the way to India. I just came back after Israel. But uh, that was his way of showing so his appreciation. I, I never could understand. He must have had some other purpose because Damal Krishna Goswami never interacted with anyone unless he had a specific, concrete, practical purpose in mind. <laughs> and so that's, uh, that's, I think, what he was doing. But I, I appreciate that he at least expressed that appreciation for whatever little I was able to do for him. He actually gave me a book stand that Prabhupada had used in Dallas and I still have it to this day and uh, that that really moved me a lot because this is what maybe 1997 or something 20 years after the Prabhupada left these things are very rare and very cherished and he, he gave this to me so I was really really very much appreciative of that at one point uh, some time later um, he had been part of this group of elder god brothers who were going and hearing from Narayan Maharaj of the Gaudiamat and taking instructions from him, particularly about matters pertaining to Raganuga Bhakti. And uh, the GBC decided that this is not a healthy influence on ISKCON. And so again, they, they told him and basically everyone who was doing that, that you can't do this. And so Tamal Krishna Maharaj again surrendered to what the GBC said and 
he disassociated himself from Narayan Maharaj, but he was very, he, he always felt very, very bad about that because he was afraid that he might have committed some offense, which I don't think he did, and he certainly didn't intend to, but he felt it was necessary because his first priority was obviously Srila Prabhupada and Iskand. And so he did that, but he, he, he had prostate cancer at some time after that. And so he was hospitalized for that, and he always felt somewhat guilty in his humility that maybe, maybe this was some offense I committed or something like that. But I remember at that time, maybe sometime towards the end of the 20th century, that um, he called me to Dallas just uh, because he, he was recuperating from his surgery. Actually, the doctors who had operated on the prostate, they had you know, they, it was completely malpracticed. They had left some pin or something in his body, and he was experiencing excruciating pain. And, you know, they, they finally went back and they discovered that they did just dr drastic malpractice, actually. He, he could have made a lot of money, but he didn't press any charges. He took it as his karma. He dealt, he dealt with it. But it was hard for him to get better, and uh, he needed some comfort. One godbrother that came to help him was uh, Sannyasi godbrother Ritadvija Swami. And I saw that this Ritadvija Swami was just, you know, practically living with Tamal Krishna Maharaj in the hospital. <laughs> there, was a, there was a window, window ledge with maybe this much, uh, you know, ledge on the window, and this Ritadvija Swami was lying down on that window ledge in Tamal Krishna Goswami's room and, and sleeping there every night because he didn't want to leave him. Really, really very, very admirable behavior. And uh, maybe it was him or maybe it was another godbrother who told me that when Tamal Krishna Goswami had first returned from the hospital and was recuperating, the phone was ringing off the hook all day long every day. So he had to answer the phone so that TKG could rest and, and recuperate. And he said, I never realized what, how much service this man has done for our movement until I had to actually fill his shoes in some respects and answer his phone. Because every day, he said, the phone is constantly ringing. Some devotee from over here is calling up and saying, what would Prabhupada do in such and such a situation? Over there, somebody else is calling from another corner of the world that, you know, why did, you know, why did Prabhupada set this policy? I need to know that. What was the context? Only Tamal Krishna Goswami knew these things. Nobody else. Only, only he had that level of, uh, you know, I want to say, uh, confidence in Srila Prabhupada that he could, you know, he, he could be privy to that kind of information. So what was Prabhupada's policy on this? Why did Prabhupada... You know, so what would Prabhupada do in such and such a circumstance? What about this one? What about that one? So many things. Only TKG knew these things. And uh, this god brother was very impressed that, you know, somebody, any one person could, could know all these things and <laughs> manage all these things. Practically speaking, I can say from recollection that in 1977 and 78, Tamal Krishna Goswami, uh, well, up until 77 November, Tamal Krishna Goswami was running the movement. That's why, you know, I didn't see that there was any problem that he was expanding so rapidly post-1979 and 1980. He, he really, you know, he had the experience. And Srila Prabhupada himself was taking a walk with TKG on the roof of the Lotus Building in Mayapur. That was the only building in 1976. And Srila Prabhupada himself told Tamal Krishna Maharaj, there has to be one man. He said, we've expanded worldwide. We have our institution solid now. One man has to know everything. And Tamal Krishna, he told this to Tamal Krishna, just the two of them. And Tamal Krishna Goswami told Srila Prabhupada, That's, isn't that why you uh, you created your GPC, Srila Prabhupada? Srila Prabhupada said, yes. But still, there has to be one man who knows everything. <laughs> you, you can interpret it as you want, but this is what Prabhupada said. So... This, this was the impression that, you know, another godbrother got it through answering Tamal Krishna Goswami's phone for a couple of weeks. That, uh, you know, tremendous, tremendous service, wide-ranging uh, array of concerns that no one person could deal with other than him. 
which is why Prabhupada always called on Tamal Krishna Goswami to solve any problem when everybody else failed, and that was many occasions. People couldn't get it right, but Tamal Krishna Goswami would not fail. When he was at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, uh, he had a GP, a G, uh, he had a grade point average of 4.0, which is perfect, 100%. And Tamal Krishna Goswami went to the office to complain about it. Because, <laughs> you know, he, he thought that, you know, that, he was just such a person that he he had to be the best at everything. He had to be in charge of everything. He had to excel. He had to get whatever Prabhupada wanted done. On one occasion in Mumbai, <clears throat> at some point in time, he was very ambitious. He was really ambitious. He was, in, in a positive way. He wanted to gain Prabhupada's confidence and Prabhupada's trust. And he just really thrived on that. So he saw that, he knew that Prabhupada had a key that Prabhupada kept with him all the time. That key opened an Almaty, which had another key, which went to some other place that had, you know, some other secure arrangement to keep all the official documents and papers and, you know, title deeds and bank account information for the whole of ISKCON. Prabhupada kept this one key with him at all, and he never, ever gave anybody that key. Tamal Krishna Goswami, therefore, wanted that key. <laughs> and he was determined. And we've already discussed his determination was such that, you know, it was, it was intolerable for an ordinary human being. His determination was too intense. Sometimes in his company, I just used to sit and marvel, how can one human being, you know, contain so much determination and so much drive and, 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 and ambition within himself? It was inconceivable to me. <clears throat> so... He, he decided within himself that he's going to do whatever it takes to, to gain that level of trust uh, from Srila Prabhupada. And uh, so finally he succeeded and Prabhupada gave him the key. And Prabhupada knew exactly what he was doing. And Prabhupada also was playing along with the game. Prabhupada always knew what everyone was doing. Shruti Kirti told me that, you know, one time he came to Mangalarati in New Dwarka, only one time, and Prabhupada immediately called him on that morning. All the time he was Prabhupada's servant, Prabhupada never called him, he could go, but, you know, he didn't go because it was his duty to stay, but one day he decided to go. That day Prabhupada called him, and Prabhupada knew everything. Anyway, so Tamal Krishna Goswami got the key, and then what happened? he lost the key <laughs> and he was you you can imagine i mean maybe you can't imagine I, i'll say this much i cannot imagine the level of anxiety that tamal krishna goswami was in after having lost that key because tamal krishna goswami was always in anxiety about something or many things simultaneously so, you know, but he said that he turned that whole place upside down, the entire temple complex. He had teams of people searching in different areas for this key. And he himself just took the whole place apart, especially in Prabhupada's quarters, trying to find that key. He couldn't find the key. It was obviously Krishna's arrangement. So he had to humble himself out and go to Prabhupada and admit, Prabhupada, I can't, I've lost your key. And when he did that, Prabhupada just very calmly looked at him and said, call the entire GBC. <laughs> and Tamal Krishna Goswami said, oh my God, what's going to happen now? Are they going to throw me out of the movement? Well, you know, what is my fate? Am I Guru Aparadhi? Is my spiritual life finished? I mean, I've destroyed the whole ISKCON. So, <clears throat> what a test. Anyway, um, I don't know, somehow or other, I think they just changed the lock or something, but uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj was in anxiety at that time. And then shortly after Prabhupada left in 1978, uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami was sitting in Prabhupada's quarters on the same sofa, and he just happened to put his finger underneath the, there was the key.
the same place he had searched so many times before. Many, many times he searched this whole thing, took it, every cushion, everything, he took it apart. The key wasn't there. The key was there. So, anyway, this is another story that indicates the character of Tamal Krishna Maharaj. Aruna Prachur